Okay, it'll take me about two minutes to switch over slides, but unfortunately we can't take a long break. Okay, everybody, we have to uh, keep moving forward, otherwise we won't get you out of here on time. Um, the good news is I just heard from David uh, that he bought some wine. Uh, so <laughs> we're going to have some, uh, we're going to have a reception afterwards, so you can relax and beat the traffic and not worry about getting out of the area first. So we'll have a nice reception outside of the building. Um, so please, please do take your seats. Um, we need to keep moving, otherwise people won't get out of here on time. Okay. Hi. Hi. 
Okay, we truly need to get started, everybody. So let's let's sit down, please. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Am I too loud? Hi, Barbara. Good afternoon. My name is Stephen Keelan. I'm a landscape historian. I'm uh, on the stewardship council of the Cultural Landscape Foundation, which is in Washington, D.C. Um, I'm the incoming president of the California Garden and Landscape History Society. I'm on the board of Docomomo SoCal and now Palm Springs Preservation Foundation. So today we're going to do sort of a really high level overview of landscape modernism in Southern California. Uh, some of the context to really bring it together because it's, you know, modern landscape is sort of hard to define and unless you really, you know, here's a, this is Frederick Emmons house of Jones and Emmons in Pacific Palisades. If you take the house out of it, can you really say why this might be modern? The other thing about modern landscape is, 60 years on now, if you come back, the trees are living things, they'll grow, they might die. Uh, if this place wasn't maintained properly, it could look entirely different than this does today. While the house, though, if it was maintained, probably would still look the same and, and convey what Jones and Emmons wanted to convey with the, with the house. So landscape design in California, in Southern California in particular, uh, in a really boiled down tiny little nutshell, there was colonial recreation with the Spanish coming and conquering the Native Americans. After that, in not a linear, literal way, was imported eclecticism, and then a search for a regionally appropriate design. So those were sort of happening around the same time, and that bled into modernism. So. If, when the Spanish came and, and uh, with Father Sarah and created the missions, they brought with them their ideas of what, what landscape, what architecture was like. And uh, so you see here, this is the Henrife, and it, the sort of creating an oasis in a hot, dry climate with just a little bit of water when you had it. And so in Southern California, this is what the, the Spanish brought to uh, landscape design, though the missions were really places of work, they didn't really have designed landscapes. Later on, after uh, California became California, people were coming from New Jersey, from Europe, bringing their own ideas of what landscape and architecture look like, and usually it's uh, their architecture from their home, trees that they brought, probably not really appropriate in this climate, required a lot more water but they wanted their own little piece of home right here in California. If you read the magazines of you know, the early 20th century, it's, you read lots of articles of architects, landscape architects, really trying to come up with a vernacular, or sort of a regionally appropriate design for Southern California. Um, they all often look back to the Mediterranean because the climate in Southern California is Mediterranean compatible. The Ramona, the book by Helen Hunt Jackson from 1884, which she wrote to really shine a light on the mistreatment of Native Americans, but it really created this tourist boom, which lasted up to the time of World War II. So you see here Ramona, though she was a fictional character, here was her marriage place. So you could come to these you know, beautiful gardens that really never existed in the time of Ramona. They were romantic recreations, reinterpretations of what old California would be. So in the 20th century in, in California and around the world, there was sort of this back and forth between the Beaux-Arts formal axial arranged landscape and the romantic English tradition of a landscape that was designed to look like it was always there. 
So the, the grand estates of Southern California, you know, with the oil and the Hollywood boom, were done in this style, usually towards the house where to work with the geometry of the architecture, they might have an axial arranged formal garden. But as you got out further from the, the house, it was a more free form uh, landscape. But by the 19, by around 1930, those uh, projects were slim. So modernism in landscape architecture, uh, it was slower to evolve than it did in architecture or even decorative arts, interior design. They usually evolved a little bit later. Landscape architecture, interestingly, was not taught at the Bauhaus. And so it, it, it became slower. So these are some early uh, modernist landscapes in Europe, late 1920s. This is in Belgium. Whoop. This is Belgium. This is Villeneuve and uh, Pierre. So based on cubic art, they would create these landscapes were really meant to be looked at. These early landscapes were not really places you would live in or, or they weren't outdoor rooms, they were paintings you know, on the ground. In Southern California, really around the late 20s, early 30s, the local architects and landscape architects were working together to come up with something that used historical vernacular precedent but not in any sort of literal way. And so this is the House of New Ideas by H. Roy Kelly, who was sort of a Southern California version of William Worcester that Alan just talked about. And he worked most frequently with Fred Barlow Jr. as Worcester worked with Tommy Church. This was just torn down about two years ago. So Irving Gill, which we heard from Alan, used these innovative, really simple, tilt-up concrete forms in a you know, with a nod to the mission style, but he always worked with a landscape architect because the building wasn't complete unless it had a really wonderful landscape. He worked with Wilbur Cook, who was the first trained landscape architect to open an office in Southern California in 1903. But he would, you know, with these creamy white walls, the tree branches leaving shadows, animating the walls, these old California uh, inspired things like cup of gold, bougainvillea. None of these are native, but they were things the Spanish brought and became sort of native in their own way. In Southern California, there were, you know, coming to their own sort of ideas on what was a contemporary landscape, not necessarily modern in any ideological way. In 1937, the San Francisco Museum of Art had the first show of contemporary landscape, the first of its kind anywhere in the world, really. And so they sought with photographs, models, drawings, to really show you what a contemporary landscape was with some historic background for context. And one of the things that they came up with, there were three things, the indoor-outdoor relationship, which California always had a leg up on that. This is a Coahuila Indian structure, a wonderful outdoor living room enclosed with, with a human scale, perfect indoor-outdoor relationship. This is a, a modern house. It's by Palmer Sabin for Mrs. Daniel Burnham, the widow of the Chicago planner and architect. When after she, uh, she became widowed, she moved to this house, which is on the property right behind the Huntington Hotel in Pasadena. So it's sort of a stylish, modern version of a Spanish hacienda ranch on the outside. Inside, there was this wonderful organic sort of indoor-outdoor relationship. Bashford and Barlow worked in close collaboration with Palmer Sabin. The architects of that time really believed that their buildings would be enhanced with the collaboration of a good landscape architect. So they really encouraged their clients from the outset to hire one so that they could collaborate, really design these things from the outset to work most successfully. And here they did. They worked, you know, they cited the house to retain this mature grove of, of eucalyptus trees and the floor inside the house into this sun porch all the way out to this patio was all one level. The other thing they did to bring the indoors in and the outdoors, outdoors in, indoors out, there are these planting beds inside, same on the outside, planted with the same shrubbery with these skylights above. On the wall here that you can't see, there's this chrome and marble fountain which related to a pool on the outside to sort of blur the line between inside and out. The other thing that 1937 show sought to showcase was the functional landscape. 
In the 1930s, the 40-hour work week had just become standard, so recreation was another important uh, consideration in the landscape. So these were smaller lots than the landscape architects were working on in the 20s with these mansions. This is a really interesting set of three houses for some young Caltech professors in Pasadena. So they hired Webster and Wilson and Bashford and Barlow to design this set of three houses on Bonnie Court in Pasadena near Caltech. So what you see here, they, they pulled the, the houses forward. These two have a shared garage. Every house has its own private outdoor space. But because these three professors were fiends for badminton, they have a shared backyard with a badminton court in the middle. So they have lots of shared open space. They were able to maximize this. They have their own small gardens and then the you know, private outdoor patios. Here's another Fred Barlow you know, building out on this. This is four houses that have their own you know, private outdoor garden space, but they consolidated the back part of each of their lots. They have a swimming pool, a badminton court, and some jungle gym equipment. So all of their gardens have an individual quality, but they all open up to this uh, shared recreation space. And even on the individual lot, this is an H. Roy Kelly house in San Gabriel with Fred Barlow. So there, you know, there's a nice patio with a reflecting pool, but in this motor court, he scored lines in the driveway and sunk poles, so when it's not being used to store cars, you have a badminton court. Collaboration was really the, the point they tried to make with the 1937 show that really with collaboration between the client, the architect, and the landscape architect from the outset, interior designer too, you would really get the best product of you know, all this, this work. This is the, called the Ship of the Desert in Palm Springs. Uh, I picked this because Miller Cheats was a color consultant. So Sunset Magazine called this because, because of the streamlined nautical de detail, it was the Ship of the Desert. So the clients were Colonel Howard C. Davidson and his wife, Mary. They hired Webster and Wilson. Honor Easton was the interior designer. Actually, Honor Easton and Earl Webster were watercolor artists, and that's how they knew Miller Cheats. And so Bashford and Barlow were the landscape architects. Miller Cheats was the color consultant. So what he did is chose, you can't really tell in this, it's an old Kodachrome. The body of the house is a pale yellow, which is like the brittle brush uh, wildflower you see in early spring. The window trim was a sage green to match the foliage. And the, the base of the building is a really dark brown uh, band, which ties in with these rocks that are pulled down from the mountain to really you know, ground the building. But really, they designed this. Every stage of this was designed as a collaboration. This is a painting by Ramos Martinez. Uh, there's a wonderful mural here at the college. So all the color palette was pulled from that painting. All the furniture was built in for the most part. For the landscape, Bashford and Barlow uh, referenced this circular sort of living room and created this circular garden ringed with grapefruit trees, just a really small panel of turf. They only used this house in the winter um, months, but he, you know, he thought it would make sense just to have a small patch of grass that you could actually use. Uh, every single room in the house has an access to a balcony or an outdoor space. This was all native desert shrubbery. But look at this, this is all now just filled with houses. So this is 1937. Really, so this, the Southern California landscape architects we were talking about were typically Beaux-Arts trained like the architects they were working with. It wasn't until late 1930s, Garrett Ekbo, James Rose, and Dan Kiley were three uh, landscape students at Harvard GSD. And they really resisted the Beaux-Arts training they were getting. And though there was no modernism taught in the landscape department, they started taking architecture classes with Walter Gropius, who had just arrived. And it really activated them. And they, James Rose actually got expelled because he wouldn't finish his Beaux-Arts work. But they started really coming up with a new philosophy for what modern landscape would be. Um, and then they started writing articles in pencil points and architectural forum and really helped to change the way uh, 
landscape was, was thought about. So let me read a quote here from, so they were influenced by the work of modern artists. Uh, so like I said earlier, the, typically it was a, a fight between the Beaux-Arts trained formal modern, not modern, the formalism and the, the informal. So Ekbo said, 18th century designers banished not only axial symmetry, but every, every other sign of formal man-made design. Their effort was to follow the irregular, picturesque balance of natural scenery at its best. In no time, the proponents of each school were tearing each other's hair out for no particular reason that really any modern designer can understand. The two were kept strictly apart for 200 years. Now the effort's being made to harmonize the two by mixing formal and informal where common sense and true aesthetic satisfaction warrant. The combination is deliberate, a method of relieving the often monotonous stiffness of the formal work and bringing manifest order into nature, which in more cases than not seems to express chaos rather than design. The old axis is retained in spirit, but changed almost beyond recognition. It's shattered and its frag fragments move, duplicated and bent, as in the theoretical axis of any good natural scenery. Formal objects are put thus into a cult rather than symmetrical balance. So here's a Kandinsky painting on the right. This is a design that Ekbo did for a, a bay in, uh, Bay Club in Newport, and you can really see the influence. So the, these are, the spaces are organized around these bent, broken axes rather than any sort of traditional axis. So Mark Tribe, if a, a landscape historian, has these six axioms for modern landscape architecture. A denial of historical styles, which I think is more true around the country than in California, which sort of Ekbo just said that they, they, they didn't deny it, they were inspired by it. A concern for space rather than pattern. Landscapes are for people, a functionalist program based on human use. The destruction of the axis. Plants are used for their individual qualities as botanical entities in sculpture and the integration of house and garden. Really it was this book, Gardens in the Modern Landscape by Christopher Tunner that, that inspired and, and uh, influenced the whole generation of landscape architects, even more than the Ekbo, Rose, and Kiley articles. Uh, Tunnard wrote, the functional garden avoids the extremes both of the sentimental expressionism of the wild garden and the intellectual classicism of the formal. It embodies rather a spirit of rationalism and through an aesthetic and practical ordering of its units, provides a friendly and hospitable milieu for rest and recreation. And it's really this quote, I think, that expresses what modernism in landscape is. The right style for the 20th century is no style at all, but a new conception of planning the human environment. I think, you know, the, on the East Coast, they were really, the young landscape architects were taking to heart what Ekbo, Rose, and Kylie were writing about. But in Southern California, they really, it wasn't so, uh, they, they had evolved in a different way. And so they were always thinking in, in new ways about space and planning. Landscapes are for people was one of Mark Tribe's uh, axioms. And right before World War, World War II, landscape architects and architects who were trained in the Beaux-Arts were joining together to create these wonderful uh, public housing projects that were influenced by Clarence Stein's garden cities on the East Coast. This is a slum in downtown Los Angeles. There were slums unlike anything we can imagine today. Uh, that's City Hall right there. So they would work together to create these garden city uh, developments that really landscape was an integral part, recreation, uh, social projects. They had well baby clinics and movie nights and all sorts of things to build community. So these were built all over the country, but really in Southern California, in Los Angeles in particular, they were the first integrated communities really in the country. And so Usually the, they would be given a mandate if you're going to do a slum clearance project and build a new development and it's a predominantly African-American community there, then you market that to African-Americans mostly. But the housing authority, the city of LA said, we're not gonna do that. Anyone who's qualified can uh, apply and, and, and join this community and apparently they all lived harmoniously and it was the first time people really lived together this way.
This is Bashford and Barlow with Roland Cote as Avalon Gardens. So it's this, you know, you still see the vernacular, these low sort of ranch style modern buildings. Uh, I had to, with the time, the, the site plans for these are really terrific. This is sort of the, the ultimate, it's Baldwin Hills Village, 1941. So Clarence Stein, who developed these concepts on the East Coast, was a consulting architect with Reginald Johnson, uh, Merrill Alexander and Wilson, and Fred Barlow was a landscape architect. But you see here, this is the typical sort of gridiron street pattern. This is Baldwin Hills Village. It's uh, 629 units, about 80 acres. There are no through streets whatsoever. So you can go from any one of these 629 front doors to any other one and never encounter a car. Their mandate was to tame the car. And really you see, you know, the, the plant palette was the old California plant palette, but done in an entirely modern way. The architecture referenced Monole Monterey Colonial in a really simplified modern way. But the landscape uses these materials in a new way, from the building out to the sidewalk where one of five different ground covers to really emphasize the horizontal lines, work with the architecture. All the sidewalks were decomposed granite, the warm golden tan. What's interesting, I worked on the CLR for this for about 10 years. And so this is, you know, Fred Barlow did uh, lots of these projects and he really believed grass should only be used where you actually are going to use it. It doesn't make sense in Southern California. So this is the as built plan for the grass where you see the green. All the other places, so here's how it is today. So those green spaces weren't, weren't dry, they were just shrub masses or ground covers or, or tree masses. Uh, one of the problems with this, this, we did the cultural landscape report, got Charles Birnbaum to consult, but the community really wanted to keep their grass, even with the drought, so it's sort of been put on the shelf for now. So post-war, this is what you really think about with modern landscape design. So in the post-war period, you know, there was this optimism, exuberance, all the people returning from World War II who had come through Southern California wanted to move back. 1950, Garrett Ekbo wrote Landscape for Living. It became, you know, the, the textbook for landscape architects for decades. The other important thing, Southern California hosted the first national ASLA conference in Ohio in 1950. Um, Southern California, well actually anything west of the Alleghenies was considered not even worthy of interest by the ASLA. So this is the first time it was ever, this is the group shot. Um, if you read old landscape architecture magazines, usually after a conference there might be a few paragraphs about the agenda. After this conference there were pages of articles just glowing about how, how beautiful Southern California was, how great the Southern California ASLA was. And from that, Fred Barlow was elected the first vice president of the national ASLA in 1951. The other important thing, licensure for landscape architects uh, became the thing in 1953. So in the post-war world, uh, the hand of the landscape architect really was everywhere you looked. So here's Park Plan Homes in Altadena with its Ainge Johnson and Day with Ekbo, Royston and Williams. A great, all the houses are pretty much the same house with just a different, you know, mirror image. But what Ekbo, Royston, and Williams did was come up with a plant palette, pretty limited, you know, tree palette, mix them around. So each one of these, these are, I'm going to hit the pointer. So you drive in off the street, you have this little carport. So you have these little islands in the middle. He came up with a plant palette. Here's the drawing. So as you see, as you go down the hill, the trees get taller. So you have well, this kind of interesting skyline. But plants are repeated in groupings, color, lots of different form. You see he's creating spaces with his bent axis, but with tree forms. So where you went to school also, this is Flewelling and Mil Moody Architects with Fred Barlow Landscape Architect. And they work, Fred Barlow worked with Flewelling and Moody from the very first stages on this project. Um, Barlow made sure that all the plant materials were native California plants because he said they were slow growing and durable. You don't want something that's, you know, going to give off a big show and then die in a couple years. And he created these, uh, everything was contained in, in planting beds. But this is a, one of the first indoor-outdoor 
schools. Here's the sort of a, the multi-purpose room is outside. These stairs serve double duty as, as seats. This tree is a Brazilian pepper and has grown to shade the whole area. All the hallways were outside. So where you work, this is Lever Brothers. Uh, it was Welton Beckett and Associates with Fred Barlow. This beautiful biomorphic reflecting pool outside. There were huge beds of Algerian ivy, which is sort of universally hated now, but it was really, it's the, probably the most mid-century plant there is. Fred Barlow uh, was the first one to use, to have this grown as a ground cover uh, for Baldwin Hills Village. But, the, you know, it's got volume and, and sheen and deep color to offset the greens of the grass. This is, he did the interior planting too. This was the lobby for Lever Brothers, and it was democratic whether you were the president of Lever Brothers or you boiled the soap. Everyone came in through this, this same lobby. There were wonderful outdoor patios for dining, and Bullock's, is William Pereira with Ruth Shellhorn. So these became destinations. They were so beautifully landscaped, people would come on Sundays when the stores were closed just to have picnics. So where you had, uh, where you played, here's Hollywood Park, Arthur Froelich. This is the second, there was a fire in 1949, so this is the second version. Fred Barlow with the landscape. So beautiful, you know, this here's Fred Barlow with, these are all potted geraniums, the old California sort of thing. This was just torn down. And then, of course, Disneyland. It's Ruth Shellhorn. So Walt Disney had pretty much almost bi finished building Disneyland, and he figured, he realized, you know, there was really no plan for circulation. So he called his friend Welton Beckett and said, I'm kind of screwed here. I don't know what we're going to do. And he said, oh, hire Ruth Shellhorn. So Ruth showed up, and she said that there were all these disparate sort of lands, but they just didn't hang together. So, you know, she was given about four months to really plan the designs and she was there every day overseeing the work if she said these ground covers should be six inches apart she would get down on her knees in that dress and make sure that the the grounds people put them in correctly so here's when you walk in the 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 square sort of this you know homey old town square feeling that he wanted by the 60s there were enormous sort of monumental moving the earth sort of projects uh, which involved landscape architects. These sort of things wouldn't have been done in you know, the time of Olmsted. They would have found ways to gracefully drape this building over the, the mountain and work with the landscape, but here they just leveled it so they could really maximize it. So here's the Civic Center downtown. Here's Dodger Stadium. So Dodger Stadium was Arthur Barton. He was a Berkeley graduate. Um, this was a collaboration between Walter O'Malley who was really as involved as anyone else, Colonel Prager. These champagne bowls were an interesting thing. In the parking areas, they were planted with flowers that matched your ticket color. And then when you got inside, your seat was the same color. So you would know where to park. So here you see, there was no one entrance here. They worked on this together. So really it's a car-centric stadium, the first. You would come in. Walter O'Malley was so grateful that they gave him this place and he was such a devout Catholic, the site plan is the seal of the city of Los Angeles. So there's an outer ring, which are all uh, Don Redwood trees, an inner ring, which are uh, olives, and that's a rosary. So he was able to circle his stadium with the rosaries, such a devout Catholic. So he would pull in, there were champagne bowls, let's say this is the blue level, there were blue agave or something, you'd pull in and you'd, you know, just walk into whatever level you were at. You just walked out onto the right level. Here's the other, the Civic Center. It's all of, the whole thing was done by Cornell Bridges and Troller, who were, really worked to unify the, all the different pieces. And by now, you know, they weren't breaking up the axis and, and denying the axis. Now they're embracing the axis again. So you see there's the water, Department of Water and Power, the Music Center here. The DWP was really a monument to water and power. This uh, moat, not only is it a beautiful monument to water and power, it has a functional purpose. The water is brought up through the building and it helps to cool the building. Here's the Dorothy Chandler Pavilion. So they designed this uh, pool. A woman who's writing a book about Dorothy Chandler told me 
uh, Cornell Bridgers and Troller designed this. She brought, she saw it for the first time and said, no, no, it looks like there's a bunch of little boys peeing in my new pool. So they had to turn the jets off. But water really was the unifying theme of the whole, the whole park. So they used water. There were jacaranda tree was the other thing they used to unify the whole plan. And then this park down the middle, which is now Grand Park. So modern landscapes are threatened. This is Wyvern Wood. Uh, like Baldwin Hills Village, it was a privately developed garden apartment community. It's in Boyle Heights. There's the Sears Tower. Hammond Sadler was an Olmsted trained landscape architect, and he worked with Whitmer and Watson on this. You know, and these were, you know, beautiful middle class housing prod developments, ample closet space, lots of recreation. In the years since this has become primarily a Latino community, which is thriving, they love where they live. The management has painted everything this sort of scary pumpkin color. As trees die, they just they cut them down, they don't replace them. If a sprinkler head breaks, they just cap it off. So it's sort of demolition by neglect. The uh, companies bought it maybe eight, nine years ago and ha has plans to demolish it. This is Capitol Towers in Sacramento. It's Worcester, Bernardi and Emmons architects. Lawrence Halpern was the landscape architect. Just a wonderful, it's a, a more contemporary garden apartment community that has a high rise to add to the density but this also has been bought by a developer who plans to tear it down. Both of these are national register eligible still, but here's the Fulton Mall in Fresno, Garrett Ekbo, just a wonderful mall is a terrific outdoor sculpt sculpture garden. For years, it was a really popular thing. And here it is now it's being demolished. But there are some good things happening. This is, what was what is now Grand Park and for years it wasn't that successful a thing if you're on jury duty you might go there but it really wasn't a thriving place that people wanted to go so what they did is this is the Arthur Will Memorial Fountain so they retained really the most important part of the fountain but there was this lower pad that was sort of inaccessible but now it's a splash pool for kids so they've they've even restored the sort of weird brown granite there but it's really activated this and it's a really successful place and they've they've it's still recognizable as the Cornell Bridges and Troller design these weird little volutes which are ways cars could get back into the underground parking was always a problem because it really disconnected the rest of the music center in this with the park but they've found a way to deter the parking away. So now there's this nicely landscaped terrace that goes down. You have this broad sort of outlook so you can look down and see the kids play. And that's it. together <laughs> about well I only found out about this about two weeks ago so I got up at five this morning and did it wow. I pulled from other things I had done okay I see something coming in here so uh, uh, it looks like a con no a common and a question um, Cornell designed several prominent Claremont College landscapes. He too was an early uh, adopter of the use of native plants. Can you touch on his influence? He, he was. His first partnership was uh, with Theodore Payne of the Payne Nursery. So C Ralph Cornell is highly important. He was the first university trained landscape architect to open an office in Southern California. He had come from Harvard. Uh, he went first into partnership with uh, Theodore Payne, and they, he was in partnership with Payne when he got the job for Claremont College. And so a lot of native plants were used in, in that project. Uh, he was also one of the early modernists. He did a lot of the, the housing projects that you saw on, in that phase. But uh, did I answer the question? So, the second part of the question, actually. Uh, Thomas Church designed residential and significant landscapes at Harvey Mudd College. Do we know if remnants of these still exist? I haven't been there, so I'm not sure. We had a, 
Cultural Landscape Foundation had a What's Out There weekend. Um, it's probably been three years, and that was one of the, the tour stops. So I, I imagine that there's some fabric left if we had it on that tour. But I haven't been to the site. Yes? Um, I was wondering um, if you can talk about some of the things that identify like Southern California and the vernacular that has changed a little bit in this over time. So, how did these architects feel about censoring some of these things? Okay, and just to repeat the question. Um, a question about fences and how do people feel about fences in their backyards? Do you mean in sort of a suburban setting? I think, you know, Elizabeth Gordon with House Beautiful really worked to bring this idea of creating your own private oasis in your backyards. And so the architects were having the houses were turning their backs to the street and really, you know, the it was this indoor outdoor relationship with the back of the house so that you would have this, your own private oasis. Tommy Church wrote a book called Your Private World about this. And so they did fence these off and make them as private as they could. Is that? Okay, one more question. Um, I'll let you pick which one of the two. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. Uh, you had a diagram of um, several houses having private areas and then a common area. Right. And was that conceptual or was that actually uh, implemented? And if it was implemented, was it successful? The, the three houses, the Caltech professors, that was implemented. Um, it, it was successful for as long as they all were friends and lived together. But once one of them sold their house, you know, th that sort of bond was broken and then a fence was built. So in the, in the second picture I showed that had the four houses with the swimming pool and the he made it a point to say, make sure that you build these recreational features within a property line so that if, if the house is sold, then they'll just, they'll keep that. It's not going to, the pool's not going to go over two property lines.